Thank you, Pastor Lane. Oh, cool. <laughs> Pretty loud. Um, so, well, good morning. Um, so I'm Wally, as you talked about. And uh, what did you say? Okay, I thought somebody said something. Um, let us pray. Now, Father God, we thank you for this wonderful uh, time. Thank you for the privilege uh, to speak your word and for us to also listen. Father, we come before you. We ask you, God, that you open our eyes that we will see you. I ask, oh God, even as I speak, I don't want to speak according to my own thoughts. Father, I ask, oh God, that you will make me transparent, that your people might see your glory, and, and I might see it too. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so um, do you remember what we talked about the last time? last week. I have a quiz for you. Um, so we talked about uh, the, the, the church of uh, Ephesus, and then we talked about two W's, right? We talked about a why, and then a what, right? So I'm going to just pick it up from there, right? Um, so one of the things we learned about the, 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 um, the church of Ephesus, Ephesus is that they had all their what's kind of like really figure out. But there was something wrong with their wise, and that was the motive behind it. Today, we're going to look at um, somewhat a little bit different uh, person. I consider this guy as the one who has both his what figured out. I think he's got his why also figured out. Um, can you guess who that's going to be? Um, well, that person is actually called Job. I know it's, uh, it's a passage that sometimes we actually run away from because it's a, it's a passage of a lot of calamities and the rest. Um, you be wondering why am I choosing that. But we'll kind of like it. We'll see a little bit of that as we go on. And something about Job is that he was considered a man that was blameless, right? He, um, he was a guy who had pure motive about what it is that he's, he does. Um, he feared God. And by the way, it's not a figurative character. It's actually an historical character. So he's actually someone that actually lived like you and me on this earth. And one thing, I mean, if you want to check that, you could check like Ezekiel or you check James and you kind of like have, have a feel of uh, other references in the Bible that actually mention Job. Um, so what do we know about Job? One thing we're sure about Job was that Job was very, very wealthy. Um, if you look at him, he had 7,000 sheep, um, 3,000 camels, um, 500 oxen, and uh, 500 donkeys. And if you some of us do some calculations, calculate the land that he owned, this guy actually, you know, today, he works like, like tens of millions of dollars. So he's quite like a rich guy. Um, but one thing, you will look at a rich person is that they tend to like trust in the riches a little bit. But there was something so clear about this guy is that he had, he does not, no pride at all in his riches. Um, if you go to like Job 31, verse 5, you can like see all of those. Um, one other thing you will see about him is that he was a guy with complete integrity. It's kind of like, if you look at it, that's a, a mix of like two things in today's world. Like if you're so wealthy, you think, well, you've done some um, dubious acts, maybe a little bit, maybe some. But this guy was the person that you would consider uh, of complete integrity. And in his integrity, he took care of the poor. Um, he actually is one of the guys that actually covenanted with his eyes never to look lustfully. Imagine you're making a covenant, I'm not going to look lustfully. And he stood by it. And one other thing to get to know about this guy is that he feared God. Um, and finally, you will you will think this was just only something that was noticed on the planet Earth. It actually went beyond that. God actually noticed that Job was blameless. And as we will see, we kind of like see that not only was he blameless amongst his, uh, his peers, God actually recognized that he was actually blameless among his peers. So he was not someone that was living 
uh, like a, a face value kind of like it was a total pure person. Um, so I consider Job as a remarkable guy, I, uh, uh, somebody with all the qualities that I would want to have. But the thing is, I'm not even close to this guy at all. Uh, but then something happens. Uh, so in Job 1, verse 6, 11, uh, from, yeah, from, one, so from 6 to 11, so one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with him. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. So this is where Satan actually wants to prove whether Job is actually true or not. But here's God boasting about this man. He said, Have you not put a hedge around him, his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely cause you. So, Satan has just come to meet God, right? And and this is God actually boasting about Job. So, well, God gave Satan the permission. Oh, go, go deal with him, but don't do anything. Don't touch Job at all. So Satan went, took all his wealth away, took all his uh, children, all of his children. He had ten children. All of them died one day. Uh, and then Satan came again. And then after all those incidents, do you know what Job said? Job said, what was the first song we sang? Do you remember the first song we sang today? Yeah, it gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean, I was like thrilled to hear something like that happening. After losing all your children, you lost all your wealth. But do you think Satan was going to give up? Satan went back again to God. Like, well, God was still boasting about, uh, about Job. But this time around, Job, Satan said, well, if you remove, well, maybe all of those things because they are external, let's go and touch his body. When we touch his body, then maybe he's going to cause you. So, they went ahead. Satan went ahead and actually inflicted boils, all sort of diseases you could ever think of. So this guy that was rich, wealthy, million dollar guy, now he has nothing, no one, except his wife, uh, who actually told him to actually <laughs> cause God. And then a bunch of friends who accused him of wrongdoing. But in the midst of all of these things, one of the things that we saw was that, uh, or that was written about Job was that he still kept his integrity. He's, uh, he never sinned. He blessed the name of God. And this l lets us know that this guy was a man of true integrity. It's not that his fear of God or his hearts were based on how wealthy he was. Um, it wasn't based on because he has like a good family. The question I always try to think about sometimes is that, okay, well, as I am right now, you've got things, everything away. Am I still going to be here? <laughs> uh, and that's a question we need to ask ourselves sometimes. Uh, is all our praise, all our give thanks, giving thanks to God, is it based on the things that we have received from God? Or is it just, is it much more than that? And some of, that's some of the things we want to see. So for me, if I have a lot of accolades, I'm going to give a lot to Job because this guy is just too, I mean, he's just too great. He's, he's kind of like too perfect for a human being. So what I did, so I went through the whole of Job and I was looking for something against Job. <laughs> Became like one of the accusers. Like, this guy must have something wrong with him. Well, you know, I went back and forth. There was still nothing wrong. He was still good. I mean, there may be something, but the thing is this, that God did not count anything against Job at all. 
Even at the end of it, he even told him to pray for his friends. Uh, I'm kind of like summarizing the whole of book of Job. So um, if you want to get like a little bit more deep into it, you can go read from Job chapter 1 to 42. Um, <laughs> so, um, but as you will imagine, somebody with this integrity then does something next. And this is where I think Job actually passed his boundary. <laughs> a mixed man, he was so good. But now he has gone to the extent that where he says, okay, well, I'm this so much innocent. So God, why all of these things? And so many times we go through all of those phases. We go through those, that kind of phase in our lives. Um, at this point in time, Job, with all his innocence and integrity and knowledge, was now battling against God's justice system and his power and his wisdom. And here's some of the things that Job actually said. Uh, so Job actually went ahead and confronted God with his, in, with his innocence. So he says things like, Don't simply condemn me. Tell me the charge against me. Uh, what do you gain by oppressing me? And in all of some of this, you, you can like see a little bit of, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more. I said, although you know I am, I am not guilty, no one can rescue me from your hand. What, what is the summary of something like that? Is that not like a bully? Yeah, he's calling God like a bully. Uh, but we do that sometimes. Because you, uh, we, we, um, um, when somebody misuses, misuses his power, what is that? Yeah, it's being a bully. Um, and he actually did some other questioning and like that. And oftentimes, I'm pretty sure we've gone through different phases in life and we get disappointed sometimes. Like, well, I'm this good guy. I've done all the best things that I can do. I serve God regularly. I pray every day. I fast often, if you do fast. I, um, I help everyone I meet. I'm like this good guy. I preach the gospel. Right? I, uh, I, I obey God at all times. But the question is, does God actually owe us anything? Does he? No, he does not. Because you didn't give him anything in the first place. But I would just try and give maybe a little bit of answers to some of things. Because sometimes we, we kind of like think that maybe we deserve certain blessings based on our works and all these good things and all these good things that we, we may have ever done. But, well, maybe we do, maybe we do not. But maybe let's try and look at some explanations. Sometimes maybe God is tra trying to avert tomorrow's danger. Maybe that's why he's not answering the current question. Sometimes it could be that God wants us to actually come to our wit end. You know, that's the, kind of like the first time you can actually see God. is when you've tried all your options and the rest. Because if you still have something going, yeah, you still make some other options. But sometimes God wants us to just like, well, try all the things you can. I'm waiting for you. And then, and then he shows up. But the thing is this, sometimes he actually even does not answer at all. Like, like we said, it, it's, it doesn't hold us anything. You could be asking, why has he it, has it done all of these things to me? But Job, Job asked all, this, asked all these questions, thinking that God is actually going to show up and answer him. But no, God did not answer any of these questions. But you know what God did? And that's one thing that I pray that God helps us to, each one of us to realize today. He actually just showed himself to Job. You may have so many questions, but all you actually need is just to see him. And when you see him, there is something about his presence that changes and erases even all the questions you may ever think of. And Job, who has, been con who has considered himself as this innocent guy, this guy that even God himself counted innocent, is now come, has now come to actually see God himself. Because God has decided to show himself. And that's one of the things that I want to actually then focus on today. Um, and we 
try to look at what it is. So we know about Job. He went through all these troubles. Now God has decided to show up. And just to show a little bit of him to him. And, and that takes me to Job 42, verse 1 to 6. And that's what we're going to read today. And then we can like, just go through that. Um, so let's turn to, if you, take, if you have like the Pew Bible, that will be on the page uh, 372. Job, chapter 42, verse 1 to 6. So I'm going to read from here. It says, Then Job replied to the Lord. This is after God has shown himself and asked Job a lot of questions. It says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this that obscure my plans without knowledge? Surely I know I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, Listen, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears have had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, what we've just done is what we've just seen right now is Job after seeing God. The guy who was like, so um, I won't say the word boastful, but the guy was so confident about his innocence, so confident about his knowledge about God has now come to a point where he's actually recognizing certain things that he does not have. And like I said, that this is the area I actually want us to like focus on and kind of like think about and walk through today. And that's the part that what becomes of us when we actually see God. What is the thing that actually goes in our hearts? I mean, what, what kind of illumination that do we get when we come to see and get in a different and a newer perspective of Christ? And first of all, I'll first like try to clarify what I mean by to see God. Because nobody sees God. <laughs> and lives, right? Um, so, um, to clarify that, I mean, to see God uh, means to experience a personal revelation of God. That could be physically, well, it could be through dreams, it could be through visions, it could be through the word of God, it could be whatever means. But you come into a point where you um, have an experience of a personal uh, revelation of God. Now, one of the things that uh, we'll then look at is certain we'll look at three realizations from this, from this passage we just looked at. But let me just, just go back a little bit. Now, sometimes in Christian faith, we um, all we do is Maybe we hear about God from your parents. You do all of those things. But, or maybe you, you try to struggle in terms of like reading the word of God. You have all these plans. And I will tell you a little bit of a story if time permits us. Um, but then, I want to tell you something that actually opens up the much more of God to you. It's a thing that uh, if you come to those realizations, it, it actually changes the way your Christian life actually goes. Uh, it's beyond... Uh, May I just come into church? He goes, uh, may I just read in the word of God? And what, I, what do I mean by these things I'm talking about? It's for us coming to a point where our view of God and our view of ourselves becomes corrected. If you have the wrong view of God, if you have certain view of God correct or mixed up with your own view, then the Christian walk is going to be a little bit different. But if you recognize the, the aspect of God, you recognize your aspect, the aspect that belongs to you, and you view them correctly, then your Christian walk is a little bit different. It's not boring. It's, it's more, uh, it's full of amazement. And as I said it, it means that it's a, it's a time in our life where 
we can actually go and have the abundant life in Christ. Now, I said three realizations. The first one, as we've read through uh, the book of um, Job 42, the first one is, is, in, uh, is in Job 42, verse, verse 2. So we can just quickly go there. Um, so if we look at Job 42, verse 2, it says, I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now, that means that we come to the realization that God is all. Can you say that? God is all. And not only is he powerful, he's also what? Okay. I have people right here, right? Uh, so, that God is not just powerful, but he is purposeful. And that means that it's not a God that just misuses his power. He has a purpose for every single thing that he does. And it's very good for us to come to this kind of realization. Unless you're going to keep fighting God all the time. It is easy, even for Job, because Job actually even does a part of things that he, was come, that he talked about. He talked about the, glory, the power of God. But there was something different, because at this point in time he was talking about, I am convinced. And that's certain things that we need to come to. To be convinced that God can do all things. Anytime. To be convinced of this is to have peace, peace in times of chaos. When your life seems to be going all around, like maybe you think your life is supposed to go in this way and then it's going this other route. But even in that kind of midst, you have that certain peace. It means you're convinced of what I just said right now. That God can do all things at all times. Now, if you've not seen God actually work in things like this, you, I mean, you will easily freak out. I mean, very easily. I mean, things like, a little bit like changes in your Christian work. You kind of like, um, you, you get, yeah, you get a little bit uh, clouded in, in your decision making. But one thing I want you to realize is that when you come to see God, your eyes becomes open, you recognize that God is all powerful. And one thing that we talked about last week, and I remember Pastor Lynn asking that question, asking that question, and that was that can these dry bones live again? And we said, so I'm going to ask you again, can these dry bones live, live again? Yeah. You sure about that? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you a story of another person in the scriptures that kind of like explains something close to that. Um, and in this time around, it's not like figurative or anything like that. Um, he's actually, he actually went through something of that nature. Um, and this is a man called Nebuchadnezzar. You know King Nebuchadnezzar? Um, and let's just look at the story about him. So it's, uh, it says, uh, that should be in Daniel 4. So immediately, uh, immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. This was after Nebuchadnezzar went out boasting about how great he is on his balcony of his uh, palace. Uh, and then God actually responded to him. And what it says, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and then ate grass like the ox. This is a woman been eating grass. It said his body was drenched with a view of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of time, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the most high me. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the peoples of earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. I mean, who does that? 
who can, who's the person, the only person that can do that? He went, God took him from being a king, made him eat grass until his senses were clear, and then he took him back and then he stood him back and put him as a king again. It's only God that does that. And it's only God that is powerful enough to do that. And, and it's good for us to come to that realization that we might not really grasp the depth of all of these things if we have not come to actually see him. And that's one I want to, I want to encourage us in today, also about today. Sometimes certain things happen in our lives that, I mean, we can ask, we can always ask, oh, what good is going to come out of this? But for Job, the thing about Job was that Satan meant it for his fall, but God made it beautiful at the end. You know what God did for Job? He gave them what? Times two of everything he had. So if he owned $10,000, sorry, $10 million before, now he owns $20 million. But there was a little bit of much more that he actually gave to him too. It was not just money or other things. God was actually after something. So I'm going to see that a little bit um, uh, as I kind of like go. Um, now, the other p- portion of what I said is that God is purposeful. And sometimes this, this one might be a little bit like uh, uh, something that is not clear. I mean, to us, we might just do it sometimes. And that's when we believe that God's power is, um, uh, how do I put that, um, is uh, irrational. I mean, haphazard. is. He just does it however he wants it. But there's a write-up by John Piper uh, in the Revelation of God and Suffering. And one of the things he says is that, he said, when we say the sentence, God is good, or God always does right. Now, God wants us to mean more than simply God is God. He wants us to see that his might does not make right in the sense that it could be capricious and arbitrary and irrational and nevertheless right. Instead, what he wants us to see is that his might is purposeful. Whatever God does at any point in time is with a purpose. And we can only come to the realization of all these things when we see him clearly. Now in Jeremiah 29, 11, we know that verse, right? What does it say? For I know the plans, or the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord of Lord, host, plans for you to prosper, and not to harm you. Plans to give you what? And a future. Now he didn't say hope and today, right? So that means some things in your today might be a little bit rough. But what is he looking at? He's concerned about your future. I mean, that's the key. It is more than just today. It's about the future. It's about our eternity. It's about eternal life. So many things might look wrong today, but God is using those things actually to fix us and put us in the right path. The other part, as we go on, is in Job 42, verse 3. And what it says is, I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit. He said, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? This was after Job has rambled and talked different things and questioned God. And God is now asking him back. Yeah, who is this that actually questions my knowledge? And this is one thing that I think we, I mean, if, if you do science and the rest, you, you come to struggle a little bit with some of these things. But I'm telling you that... Um, I don't care how much science you've done. The thing is, there's no comparison between um, what God has done and what science is doing. Um, what science is doing is we're just following the what? We're following the past of God, following things that He has done. You could talk about artificial intelligence. You could talk about space exploration. You could talk about I mean, different things like that. But beyond all of these things, there is. The power of God, kind of like imprinted in all of, of nature, right? Um, you might think you know something, but I mean, God actually has to job some very simple, simple questions. Say, can you command the rain? I mean, can you tell the rain? Okay, come and start right now. 
Can you do that? I can't. I mean, sometimes we even struggle with our own lives, right? <laughs> you're trying to even control your life. I mean, you can't determine when you're going to die. You don't have power over that. You, um, I mean, you woke up today, but that's all you know for now. We can't even rule the universe at all. I mean, I mean, we are even going a little bit extreme. You can't, you can't hold the universe in your hand. You can't even hold me, right? <laughs> I don't care. How, how, yeah, you can't hold me. Talk less of creating it itself. So, but many of these things, I mean, we just gloss over it and we just go by every day. But one thing. I've come to realize is that it's amazing that to see how God actually used some of this as co- his creation to actually display his works and his knowledge, his wisdom to us. That goes far beyond whatever it is we might even think about. Such that it gives us enough confidence to actually rely on him. Because he's not a God who is less knowledgeable. He's the God of all knowledge. He's all powerful. And all we have to do based on our incompleteness, we actually rely on him. That's all we need to do. And then we can get the completeness from him. The third one, because I talked about three realizations, right? The, the third realization, and this is the most important, and that's that we are unworthy. Um, you can struggle with that too. I, I can struggle with it. But if Job saw God with all his beauty, with all his innocence and integrity and everything, and all he could think about was, oh, I better go repent. Then who am I to actually come before God and actually be able to boast about whatever it is I have? In Job 42, 6, Job says, Therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. And there's something about this aspect, and that's the thing about the, the fact that when humanity meets divinity, there is something overwhelming about it. There is something that you can't just explain until you will see it or experience it. The article by Daniel Sisto, which I'm just going to quote right there, he said, Job 42 6 can be seen as the result of what happens when sinful human nature encounters the divine. And although Job's nature was sinful, his integrity remains intact and God's confidence in him was justified. But what we're after is the fact that when Job recognized his sinful nature, he had all his works all figured out. But there was something about his nature that he didn't quite get well. And that's the part of his, of his nature. When God reveals himself to us, what do we do? We see his glory. And when we see his glory, there is a knowing of the supernatural that actually transcends the material world that we, we come to behold. I mean, if you have had a glimpse of what I'm talking about, you will understand what I'm saying a little bit. And um, one thing, if we go to Genesis what do we know about Genesis? That we are created in what? In the image of God. So that is, that means that we have nothing in ourselves that actually, there's nothing in us actually radiates. There's no glory in us that radiates. No. We are actually built to do what? To reflect the glory of God. If we stay outside of beholding God I mean we are left with just whatever is left of us I don't care how much Bible you read or whatever it is when we're left beholding God at that point in time we leave our completeness and what is left is just works unrecognizable works and in what I've looked at so far I've only talked a little bit about how God has revealed himself in generation uh, well in the in the in the in the in the creation. But I want to talk a little bit much more about just beyond creation. Now, if in creation we are mesmerizing our brains, right? And we know that in the scriptures no man actually saw God face to face. But you know one thing? 
God actually revealed himself to us in all of his fullness. And that is the best revelation that you can ever have. Beyond the creation. And that revelation is in Jesus. If you go to Hebrews 1, 3, it says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being the sustaining all things by the power of his word you want to see God who do you see everything about Jesus is everything about God everything about God is everything about Jesus and one thing that came that comes to us when we have the revelation of Jesus is that all our fears turns to what? turns to love in Jesus you see a new revelation in Jesus when we see Jesus we, we come to a new dimension of, of what God actually looks like you might be afraid of God maybe because you're staying away but when you come to know Jesus what happened? All fears goes away. But this time you come to love. I, I, I was telling someone, I said, well, I came to know God because I was afraid of him. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go to hell. Because <laughs> right? that was the fear, right? But I said, the only thing that made me stay was because of his love. Because by his fear, I can't. It's not enough for me to stay. It's just going to be more of like a struggle. And if you go to Romans 8, verse 35 to 39, which I'll just read, it says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? No. Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day, and we are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And then Paul said, and I am convinced. And that's the part I want you to get. He said, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears of t for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not, nor even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky, above, in the earth, below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you send him into that? In this revelation that we have in, God, in, in Jesus, we have this complete acceptance, justification that we can call on him and call on him as our Father. We don't have to be like Job that is scared about going before God. Because in Jesus we have this boldness to go before him. Because now we are clothed with his righteousness. In this particular revelation of Jesus, one of the things we also see is that we have victory over death. These are the things we sing about. These are the things we, we have in our subconscious. But the more we behold, behold God, the more all these revelations become alive in us. And there's a way it changes, and it changes the way we walk and we do our everyday life. And there's one other thing, and that's the part that we are continually transformed from glory to glory. Now, when you came to meet Christ, you saw, well, you saw a portion of his glory. Uh, that's not RSD, though, but Pastor Lincoln can correct me if I, that's wrong. <laughs> But here's the thing, as we come before him and behold of him, what happened? We are changed from glory to glory. Which means we can't do, we can't live the Christian life outside of him. Why do you come to church? To grow. And in all of those things, what are we doing? We are beholding his glory. When I open the scriptures to, to read, what am I doing? I'm actually beholding the glory of God. So that when I go out, people don't see me. Who do they see? They see the glory of God. 
But if I don't spend time with him, if I'm so much distracted and I lose my focus and I stop seeing Jesus, what else? It's whatever it is I'm seeing that I'm going to be reflecting because that's exactly the way we are made. We are made to reflect. And if we go further and we look at 2 Corinthians 3.18, you might see what it is I want to so it says, so all of us who have have the veil removed can see and what reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. So what are all the things that I'm actually talking about? Everything I've been talking about today, talked about a man who was perfect, but when he saw God, he got a real corrected view of himself and God. And that's one thing I want you to get out of today. Is we need to get our correct views of both of ourselves and God. And not just to get that just one for one time. It's for us to continue in it. Because it's just not a one time event. You don't just come born again and then you go do something else. That's not how it works. You come, you be out of his glory. But there's something magnificent about its glory that you can't just run away. It draws you more. The more you see, well, the more you want to know. <laughs> if you come to the Christian walk and you and it's like, oh, he's buying. I'm like, oh nah. The Christian walk is not buying. It's much more mind blowing than you can ever think of. Because every day there is much more in him. But we have been changed from glory to glory. Now, as I can like go to begin to conclude, the question I ask for you I, I have for you is have you actually beheld his glory? Have you seen him? Have you come in contact with him? Or have you only heard about Jesus? Maybe through somebody talking to you about Christ or through your parents telling you. But there's something a little bit um, um, dangerous about that. The thing is that if you live like that, you can only talk about the testimonies of other people because you don't have your own personal testimony of Christ himself. So what am I saying? I'm saying that you need to seek to actually behold his glory. You need to seek to actually behold him. Come to a personal revelation of Christ himself. Like I've told you, I came out of fear, but then I stayed in love. The other response could be that, oh, I have seen him. I've seen him. I've seen him. I've seen him. I'll tell you an incident of, so I... So I get born again, I got born again, right? You, and it, it's always, That's why I said it's always like, you think you have it, and then God does something, it's like, okay, I have nothing, and then he shows you something else, and then, um, so I had born, I mean, giving my life to Christ, and, um, but then I, I was going through all these like struggles of uh, uh, trying to pray, trying to read the Bible. I'm, I was the kind of person where I, I don't eat, uh, before I read my Bible. I was like, I had all these like stringent rules, but it was like so, it was like a struggle. And then I met someone, the person said, oh, I was born again, don't forget. I, I understood Romans 10 then. And I was sure I was born again. And this person said to me, he said, it's not because of, it's not because of, because I went to person I was complaining, I was like, this, that. He said, no, it's not because of your works. It's because of Jesus. And it's like a light bulb that just kind of like went on in my head. It was like they took all this heavy load off me. And I went, left the place rejoicing. I could pray. I could hear God easily. Recognizing that it's not because of me, but it's because of Jesus. I mean, there's, there's that confidence to come to him. I, in that time period... I was saying, so I said I had like an experience of like six months as if uh, like an ecstasy. I didn't take drugs, so. <laughs> um, but it was, it was amazing. I could feel the kind of love that God actually felt, feels for somebody else. It's not, I'm not talking about me forcing myself to love. I could see it like, 
flowing out of me. I could see someone who is like sinning, and I'm not. It's not that I don't see any condemnation at all. It, it's like I'm drawn towards that person to actually just tell them, no, what you're doing is not. It's not good. There's something much more for you. It was an incredible experience for me. I was going from door to door when my classmates, I will go to them, I will talk to them about Christ. And many of them, they were actually, even they were giving up. They're like, oh, we've been serving this God. But through those events, I was able to come to actually see several people who actually needed Christ. They were believers, but they were, they've come to that point where they were actually getting um, bored and the rest. And you might be at that point today. You may have walked with him. You may have seen him. But then you're, you have this shaky, your leg is not getting shaky. You've gotten so much distracted that your sight of Christ has actually changed to something else. You've, you've come to start beholding something else. And, and I mean, the, 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 the worst of the example you can think of is Saul. You know Saul, King Saul? This guy actually started in God. No doubt about that. But this guy, after a while, became familiar with God. And sometimes we do that, don't we? Become too familiar. We go from fear to love and then to familiarity. Uh, and one thing that he did was to, he, he actually went from, he was the same guy that banned uh, witches, witchcraft. But you know what he did later? He went later to consult the same witchcraft he banned. So I'll just give you one signal. If you're going back to your vomit, ah, ah, you are passing the boundary. And what God is telling to us today is, whatever the direction might be, it might be you've heard about him, it might be that you've seen him, and God is telling you, you just need to continue in me. Or if it's that, oh, you're about shifting your boundaries. Whatever direction it is you have been, it's never too late. God is still open. He's still inviting and he's still changing people. He's still revealing himself to people. And uh, no matter how long you've been in Christ, there's still much more. Because it says, this is eternal life, that you might know me. We go and we learn for eternity, learning about God. Whatever it is you may think you may have known, it's just a, it's not even a scratch yet. So I'm imploring you. When you leave this place, I want you to go get deeper, loving God, knowing God more. And you might be on the final category. And that's the category that you've not even heard about God at all. Everything we've been saying is just like, ah, oh, I have no idea what you're saying. Well, what I can tell you is this. Jesus is your Savior. If you have any holiness inside of you, well, he's the only one that can actually feel it. There's no one else. There's nothing else that can satisfy. It's only God that can satisfy the holiness. So I don't know which category you might belong. I know the one I, I fall into. You know the one you fall into. But we'll just bow our heads. And we'll just tell God, whichever category you might think you are. And you're just going to tell God that... Uh, Lord, I want to see you. Lord, I want to see you. I want us to go ahead and pray. Close your eyes, wherever you are. And just tell God, Lord, I want to see you. Whichever, I don't, I don't know which direction or which aspect of it it might be in your life. Whether the fact of the fact that you've not even come to acknowledge God as your Lord and Savior at all. But this is not too late a time. It's time for you to actually come and acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior. And if it's that you were feeling as if you're walking away and you're having troubles with all of this, I want you to go to God and just ask Him, Oh Lord, I'm, I'm sorry, I come back to you. And if you are the one that is st still in Christ and joined fullness, I just want you to tell God that, Lord, open my eyes and let me see you more. Help me behold your glory. Help me enjoy your fullness more and more. Our God, our Father, we thank you for this privilege for us even to, to go through your word and to behold the beauty of your name. 
We know sometimes we we fall short. But Father, we thank you for that which you completed for us in Christ. And Father, we ask you, God, that help us not to be distracted by whatever it is that is around us, but help us to see beyond all the physical distractions around us and help us to be able to see you every day so that we might reflect your glory in every area of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.